Al-Anon was created out of the families and specifically the wife of Bill, who was trying to figure out how to also be healthier with an alcoholic husband who was recovering. And Al-Anon was based around this idea that you could utilize the steps for your own spiritual development, for your own growth, for your own connection, and that turning the attention to yourself, there could be healing that was separate from and next to the person who you loved who was an addict. I'm reading out of the How Al-Anon Works for Families and Friends of Alcoholics. In the back of the book, there's stories. And this is an episode that I originally aired for the bonus episode subscribers. And it's Lois's story. It's her working the steps for herself. And as I usually do, I'm reflecting those steps, that reading, in how it works with soul recovery. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Recover Your Soul podcast, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. My name is Reverend Rachel Harrison. I started Recover Your Soul after having profound changes in my life from my recovery of alcoholism, codependency, and control addiction. I was guided to share the tools and principles of spirituality and soul recovery to help others transform their lives as mine was transformed. For us to overcome external circumstances, We need to turn the attention to ourselves, focusing on our inner change and healing. Positive results in our lives will follow. Welcome back to the bonus episodes of the Recover Your Soul podcast. Thank you so much for being an Apple podcast subscriber and a Patreon member and doing this inner work of soul recovery along with me and this community. I am so thankful for your support and I'm excited that we're doing this work together. If you're new to this part of being in the bonus episodes, welcome. There is lots to go back and look at. There's an entire year, a catalog of back episodes, and you're always welcome just to go back and revisit what those are and see what you might need, what you might find along with a new episode every Friday. So recently on the Patreon members, I asked the question, what do you want to hear more about on your Friday bonus episodes? And there were equal answers around a couple things, but one of them was coming back into looking at more Al-Anon literature stuff. And I agree. I think that's a really important topic. And so I was thinking about what did I want to share with you? And what came to me was in AA, when we would read through the book, it wasn't just the beginning of the book that was so powerful. It was the stories that are at the end of the big book those that have been specially picked that can also bring to light how to be in recovery, how to use the 12 steps, how to be in a spiritual awakening, what people's lives were like. And those stories sometimes are as meaningful and powerful as the beginning content. And I thought the same thing in terms of the main book for Al-Anon, which is how Al-Anon works for friends and families of alcoholics, also a blue book. And this is the foundational text for the Al-Anon program. And so I thought I would go back to the stories and just start from the beginning, the first story, which is Lois's story. And this is the wife of Bill, the co-founder of AA. And it's a little bit longer read, and I'll probably do a lot more reading than reflecting. But When I reread this again, it was so foundational for me of the beauty of Al-Anon, the beauty of us taking a look at our part of somebody else's addiction and how we are here to heal ourselves. We're here to have our fullest life, to be able to be in our healthiest state. And I'm so grateful that all of this work has been done over the last hundred years of us learning how to be more conscious, to be more awake. And soul recovery is around waking up, not just in terms of having an addict in our lives or somebody who's dysfunctional in our lives, but even bigger than that, that this is just a stepping stone to a fuller life, a spiritual path to a happy and healthy life. The foundation of 12 step is a spiritual path. And so soul recovery is just expanding that into more. 
And just a quick reminder, I am not affiliated with Al-Anon. This is my own take on everything that I say and do. Take what you like and leave the rest. Just know that I am inspired by the Al-Anon and the AA story, but I am not here to try to be of those principles exactly. This is the Rev. Rachel take on everything. Okay, so with all of that said, I'm going to start reading. This is Lois's story. It's the first story in the experiences, sharing experience, strength, and hope in the back of how al works for families and friends of alcoholics. So it starts by saying, Bill started drinking shortly before we were married. And although I didn't realize it then, he was an alcoholic from the very beginning. When he took one drink, he couldn't seem to stop until he was too drunk to lift another drink. I was greatly concerned, but I still had confidence that our life together would be so complete and rich that he would have no need for the liquor. Did you hear that part? I had confidence that our life together would be so complete that he wouldn't have any need for alcohol, right? As time went on, his drinking got worse. Since we had no children, my one purpose in life was to help him get over this terrible habit. Man, does that really set me up for how I was in my life, that my one purpose in life was to help others, to help my husband, to fix the world. Aside from his drinking, we were very happy together. We liked the same things and were most compatible. Finally, when the drinking became practically constant, he too realized he must do something about it. And together, we tried everything we could think of. Now, one of the things I was thinking about when I read this was that so often we're in a situation with somebody who hasn't had this awakening, who hasn't had this realization. This says that he too realized that he needed to do something about it. And we need to really mark ourselves in our relationships in terms of whether we have made the decision that it's a problem for them or whether they also have made a decision that it's a problem for them. An important part of the story is that he realized he needed to do something about it. And together, we tried everything we could think of. He set up all kinds of plans for control. He read books on psychology and religion. He went to sanitariums. During two successive summers, I gave up my job, and we escaped for three months to the country for renewal and rebuilding. Nothing worked. I had to assume family responsibilities and make all decisions. By now, Bill did nothing but drink. He was afraid to leave the house for fear the police would pick him up, and we lived entirely to ourselves. We had dropped all of our friends or been dropped by them as we saw little of our family as possible. Our whole life had simmered down to one terrific fight against alcohol, and it was tragic indeed to watch such a fine man become completely beaten and hopeless. An old friend who was considered a confirmed drunkard came to see Bill to tell of his release from alcoholism by spiritual means. Bill, encouraged by the picture of his friend's bright eyes and hopeful story, went to the hospital to clear his own thinking. Here, the miracle happened, and Bill became a changed man almost overnight. We were awestruck by this amazing transformation, and our happiness and gratitude, neither of us doubted his sobriety would last. As I bring this story up to date, his sobriety lasted until his death in 1971. However, his friend's sobriety, unfortunately, was a shorter duration, but he was sober a number of years before his death in 1966. Again, what I, and she's going to come back to it, but what I want to clarify in the power of AA and the power of Bill's story is Bill's the one who wanted it. He's the one who had this part of him that really wanted to be healed. And that is the ultimate important piece when someone is an addict. I know it was my number one important piece. It goes on to say, Bill figured that since the miracle happened to him and his friend, it could happen to others. So he worked endlessly and tirelessly to help alcoholics. We had the house full of drunks and all stages of sobriety. It seemed to me he was trying to dry out all the drunks in the world. We gratefully went to meetings of the fellowship to which our our hopeful friend belonged. And Bill used a half a dozen spiritual principles in his work with alcoholics. Later, when he wrote the AA book, he expanded the number to 12 so that there was sure to be no loopholes through which the drunk could escape. After a while, I began to wonder why I was not happy, as I ought to be, since the one thing I had been yearning for in my married life had come to pass. 
Then one Sunday, Bill asked me if I was ready to go the meeting with him. And to my own astonishment, as well as his, I burst forth, damn your old meetings, and threw a shoe as hard as I could. This surprising display, display of temper over nothing pulled me short and made me start to analyze my own attitudes. By degrees, I saw that I had been wallowing in self-pity, that I had resented the fact that Bill and I never spent any time together anymore, that I was left alone while he was off somewhere scouting up new drunks or working with old ones. I felt on the outside of a very tight little clique of alcoholics, and no mere wife could enter. My pride was hurt by the fact that a friend, another alcoholic, had been able to do for Bill in a short time what I had tried and failed to do in all our married years. I thought that was really powerful because I know that we think that we can change people. We think that we have the answers. We've put all this time and energy into it, and it can be really painful and hurtful to see that somebody else makes something happen that we couldn't make happen. I think of that all the time in terms of not just alcoholism, but, you know, you tell your kids something or you tell your husband something and they dismiss you. But as soon as somebody else says it, they relate to it in a way that they actually hear it. And so part of soul recovery is we're, we're learning to not take things personally. We're learning to be in the flow of spirit. We're learning to open up to what is our side. We're learning to let go of control. So this is such a great example of that. My life's purpose of sobering up Bill, which had made me feel desperately needed, had vanished. I sought something to fill the void. As I began to be honest with myself, I realized how greatly Bill had developed spirituality and how necessary to his sobriety was his feverish activity with alcoholics. I decided to strive for my own spiritual growth. I used the same principles as he did to learn how to change my attitudes. Several years later, Bill and I found that strange relationships such as ours often developed in families after the first starry-eyed period of sobriety was over. We were heartsick and puzzled to discover that although alcoholics were covering through this wonderful new program, their home lives were often difficult. We began to learn how many adjustments had to be made and that the partner of the alcoholic also needed to live by a spiritual program. Soon, a small group composed of the family members of Alcoholics of AA sprung up all over the country. They had been threefold purpose, to grow spiritually through living the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, to give encouragement and understanding to the alcoholic in the home, and to welcome and give comfort to families of new prospective AA members. Today, Al-Anon groups have spread all over the country. Many agencies, too, recognize that alcoholism is a family problem, and that recovery can be greatly hastened by family understanding. In the next section, she talks about how our story, our practice, our healing, our growth is like a garden, that we can cultivate the garden in different ways to have positive results with beautiful flowers or to let it get overgrown with weeds. I'm going to go ahead and pass up that section because I want to move right on to her working with the 12 Steps. What she said is that her work with the steps over a period of following years is what really helped her to be able to come to a place of her own inner happiness. And so I wanted to go through her healing process. If you're ready for soul recovery, as a spiritual coach, I can support your healing to help make real changes that will bring you a life of peace, happiness, connection, and abundance. You can also work in smaller groups by taking a deep dive in a Zoom workshop or with me in person at a retreat or an event. Join others on the Soul Recovery Path once a month for the free Zoom support group or daily on the private Facebook page. Visit the website recoveryoursoul.net to book coaching sessions with me or find all the information you need about soul recovery, dates that are coming up, and how to register for those groups and workshops. To support the podcast and the community, check the links in the show notes to make a small monthly donation or a one-time donation of your choice that will make a huge impact to support this community and the soul recovery mission. Together, we can do the work that will recover your soul. Of course, step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. And she says, I was just as powerless over my husband's alcoholism as he was. 
Since I had failed in every way, I tried to control his drinking. My own life was indeed unmanageable, and I was forced into doing and being that which I did not want to be or do. I tried to manage Bill's life, although not even able to manage my own. I wanted to get inside of his brain and turn the screws in what I thought was the right direction. I, too, was powerless over alcohol. It took me a long time to see this. This, to me, is one of the most important tools as an alcoholic and as somebody who's living with somebody with addiction is to truly admit that we're powerless over the addict or as the addict powerless over whatever we're addicted to. Because otherwise, we just go into control. We just try to figure out how we're going to manipulate it. We believe somewhere that we can do or say something different that is going to change the circumstance. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And she says, because my thinking was distorted and my nerves overwrought, I had fears and attitudes that certainly were not sane. Anybody relate to this? I know I do. Finally, I realized that I too had to be restored to sanity and that by only having faith in God, in AA, and later in Al-Anon, in my husband and myself, that this could come about. And when I think about this, I really think of the word sanity. And for everybody, that looks a little bit different. But she's using the word distorted in her thinking. When we start looking clearly and honestly at ourselves and how we want to manipulate and change the other people in our lives and how that is causing us such unmanageability, such pain, such suffering, we can only come to the place of sanity when we're willing to turn it over, when we begin to have trust and faith that there is a power greater than ourselves that can return us to sanity. And what does sanity look like? Step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him or her or it or they, whatever works for you. Self-sufficiency caused by the habit of acting as a mother, nurse, caretaker, breadwinner, as well as always thinking myself on the credit side of the ledger with my alcoholic husband on the debit side, resulted in my having a smug feeling of rightness. I love this. I had never really thought about it like a ledger. Thinking myself on the credit side and my husband on the debit side, right? And the smugness, our self-sufficiency that we think we're the ones that are doing it. At the same time, illogically, I felt a failure at my life's job of helping Bill to sobriety. All this made me blind for a long time to the fact that I needed to turn my will and my life over to the care of the God of my understanding. I believe smugness is one of the worst of all sins. Only with great difficulty does the shaft of light pierce the armor of self-righteousness. Ooh, that's quite a line. I know I had the armor of self-righteousness, and sometimes I still do. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. She says, here is where, when I tried to be really honest, I received a tremendous shock. Many of the things that I thought I did unselfishly were, when I tracked them down, pure rationalizations. Rationaliza rationalizations to get my own way about something. The disclosure doubled my urge to live by the 12 steps as thoroughly as I could. I think this is the part that is so foundational in Al-Anon and in soul recovery is being honest with ourselves and realizing that even though it's out of pure intention, that we need to be mindful and cautious of what our actions are and that, that we rationalize why we're doing something because the truth is we want it to be the way that we want it and ultimately control of others doesn't work. We can make people do what we want through shame, through manipulation, but true change of people happens on their own within themselves. And so we're concentrating in soul recovery on that change that we are having within ourselves, changing our perception, letting go of our belief that we are going to change something or someone else. So this step is really 
around us being honest with ourselves and has such an opportunity for us to see things in a new way, a healthier way, a clearer way, a way of healing, awareness, compassion, and ultimately forgiveness. She goes on with step five to say, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. And her writing is, I found this was just as necessary for me to do as it was for an alcoholic, even more so perhaps, because my former mother and bad boy attitude towards Bill. Admitting my part helped to balance our relationship, to bring it closer to the ideal partnership. At first, I was deeply hurt because someone else has done in a few moments what I had tried my whole life to do. Now I have learned that as a wife, I can rarely, if ever, do this job. So this is important to hear, that her awareness that our belief that we can fix somebody else is not our job and generally doesn't happen. So I think this is a powerful foundation, all part of Al-Anon is to really take this in. It goes on to say the alcoholic feels his wife's account has been written on the credit page of life's ledger, and he believes his own has been on the debit side. Therefore, she can't possibly understand. Only another alcoholic with a similar entry can understand. I found no peace of mind until I recognized this important fact. In step five, When we say to another human being, we sit down with somebody else and we share our grievances, we share our resentments, we look at all those places in our life where we're holding on to energy. And from an AA and Al-Anon perspective, it's done differently than I do it in soul recovery. But it's around the same concept, which is to witness ourselves with clarity and to see ourselves in a way that lets go of who's to blame, lets go of somebody being right and somebody being wrong, and opens up the opportunity for us to notice and see what our patterns are, to notice and see where we've come from our upbringing with certain beliefs and how we've used our addiction or our attempt to control others where we've created character defects, as they're called in AA and Al-Anon, and I call them defense mechanisms, but where we create these parts of ourselves that come from a darker side, that come from a place where we're not our healthiest, truest self, where we have distorted thinking, and we're working on letting go of that distortion and coming back to sanity, handing it over to our higher power and not being in charge. So step six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And she says, there were selfish attitudes that I had felt justified in keeping because of what Bill or somebody else had said or done to me, right? So we feel justified when we're not in our healthy place about these attitudes, these ways of being, these these ways that we interact with people or how we think it should be or our control. She says, I had to try very hard to want God to remove these. Oh my gosh, I totally can relate to this because when I first started doing this work, some of those defense mechanisms, some of those character traits, if I was honest with myself, that is how I thought I had to control things. And when I was willing to let them go, it meant that I was letting go of how I had operated for a long time. And it was not easy. So I love that she said, I had to try hard to want God to remove these. There was, for instance, my self-pity at losing Bill's companionship. Now that the house was full of alcoholics and we had little time to visit alone with each other, I didn't realize the importance of his work with others, nor did I know how deep and consuming an absorption in AA it would take to banish the obsession with alcohol. That's her allowing Bill to just be himself to accept fully his journey and his experience and to not try to control or manipulate or change it. And when we do step six, which is to look at these aspects of ourselves and be ready to have God remove from us all of these unhealthy ways of being, something pretty profound happens. 
Step seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. She says, humbly was a word I never fully understood. It used to seem servile to me. Today it means seeing myself in true relation to my fellow man and to God. While striving for humility myself, it was inspiring to see my husband's growth in the same direction. From an inferiority-ridden person during his drinking days, Bill and AA had first bounced way up to superiority, but then leveled off and gained real humility. I actually love that because I think that that is so common in so many ways that when we start to get better and we start to heal, there can be a tendency to think that we are superior, that we figured it out, that we're higher, that we're on some different level, that um, that everybody should look up to us. And it's only natural because our ego does that. Our ego attaches to that kind of, look at me, look at what I've done. I'm, I'm better than you all now. And really, we're all the same, no matter where we are on the path. We're just human beings trying to figure it out. The more we allow ourselves to not have superiority and specialness over others, the more that we just can have gratitude for our own experience, for our own healing, and deep compassion for the people around us who may still not on that path yet, that's where humility lies. So I actually love that she mentions this about the founder of AA, right? That that he had had such low self-esteem and then felt so good about himself and then came back to humility, came back to just being one with everyone. Slowly and with difficulty, I realized I too had been beset by both inferiority and superiority supervisory over Bill in the old days while he was drinking, and then inferiority to him as he made rapid progress in AA. Step eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. She says, at first I couldn't think of anyone I had harmed. I relate to that. I thought the same thing the first time I did the steps in Al-Anon. But when I broke through my own smugness, there's that word again, smugness, I've been using self-righteousness, but I, I think I like smugness better because it's it's more true to sort of this, you know, it's not, self-righteousness can be um, overbearing and smugness is an inner thing that we think we know better. So um, she says, but when I broke through my own smugness, even a little, I saw many relatives and friends that I had resented and to whom I'd given short, irritable answers even in long-standing friendships. In fact, I remember one friend at whom I threw a book when after a nerve-wracking day he annoyed me. And then it says in parentheses, throwing seems to have been my temper tantrum outlet. As remember, she said with Bill, she threw something as well. I try to keep my list of persons harmed up to date, and I also try to shorten it. Now, I think it's really fascinating when we start looking at, and, and this is a much longer topic, so I'm not going to go into it very far, but harm is a complicated word because there's conscientious and harm that we do on purpose, and then there's harm that we do that we're not aware of. And again, this is just an opportunity for us to look at ourselves with honesty and to not think that we're the only ones that got harmed but to start to look at how our behaviors, our actions, our words, how they were taken by somebody else, either whether we wanted them to be harmful on purpose or not, may have affected them in a hurtful way. And that's really about us letting go of that smugness, that self-righteousness that thinks that we are without um, any fault in anything. We're taking a look at our part in honesty and without shame and without guilt and without grievance. Step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And she says, this is just as important for me as for the alcoholic. I found that when I cleaned away the debris of the past by making amends for each harm done, I had taken an important step towards building a bulk word against my hard knocks that might later come along, as well as gaining serenity and joy in living. You know, connecting with people in an honest way and having clarity around what our 
actions or our words or our responses may have been and cleaning away the debris of the past, as she says, is an incredibly profound opportunity for you to take care of yourself, to find forgiveness in yourself. And again, we don't have control of the other person or how they respond to it or what their part is. We're, we're taking the attention to ourselves and being willing, whenever possible, to let people know that we take responsibility for our side. And it doesn't mean we're responsible for every single thing. That's a whole other topic as well, thinking that we need to go around and amend for stuff that really is not our responsibility to hold. Another balance point. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. She says, it's astounding how each time I take an inventory, I find some new rationalization, some new way I've been pulling the wool over my own eyes. Oh my gosh, this is such a profound line to me because the soul recovery journey, the healing journey is layer after layer after layer. And if we're honest with ourselves, if we keep doing this work, we are only deepening our awareness and our knowing of ourself. And it's so incredible to look in a new way without judgment of ourselves or others and just see where we continue to use old patterns, use ways of communicating, use ways of being that is pulling the wool over our own eyes. So I just thought that was so great. It's easy to fool oneself about motives and admitting it's hard, but very beneficial, right? So just continuing the process. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand God praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. And she says, I'm just beginning to understand how to pray. Bargaining with God is not real prayer and asking him for what I want, even good things I've had to learn. It's not in the highest form of prayer. I used to think I knew what was good for me. Therefore, I was the captain and would give my instructions to my lieutenant, God, to carry out. That's very different from praying only for the knowledge of God's will and for me, the power to carry it out. That's really powerful if you think about that particular line. And again, that could be a whole episode all on its own that we're opening up to something so much bigger. And I've said before that for many of us who had religious upbringings that made us feel like God is a punitive God and that God's will is for us to be small and to be subservient. My belief is that spirit, higher power, cosmic consciousness, the word God has a lot of um, complexity in it, but wants only the best for us. And that when we allow ourselves to really be in the flow, to believe that we are being guided and directed and that what we need is the strength and the courage to carry out these messages of greatness that are being offered to us. That's how I hear that. She goes on to say, today's living is so involved that much time for meditation is hard to find. I totally get this, how many of us are too busy to do our spiritual practice. But she says, I've set aside a small amount of time, night and morning. I'm so filled with thankfulness to God that gratitude is one of my principal subjects for meditation. Gratitude for all the love and beauty and friends around me. Gratitude even for the hard days for long ago that taught me so much. Thus, I've made a start towards improving my conscious contact with God. It's so important for us to do this step. And I think sometimes we think, oh, you have to get through all the steps. Read the steps. And you don't have to be at step 11 to have a daily meditation, prayer, spiritual practice. This is the reminder that we are consciously doing these steps all the time, that this spiritual practice allows us to be on the journey every day. And that that's the important part that keeps us coming back, keeps us on track that it's not something that you just do one time and then you're finished with it. Okay, wrapping up on step 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. This is one of my favorite lines. 
having had a spiritual awakening as the result of this work, having changed our lives, having had things change, having had our perception change, not the people around us, but our perception of ourself. We tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all of our affairs. She says, I am, like many Al-Anon members, whose spiritual awakening was a slow developing experience, a reminder that it's not all at once. This is something that we do slowly, steadily, one step at a time. She says, but all of us, whether awakening was sudden or gradual, need to continue our efforts towards growth. One either moves forward or slips backwards. I sincerely hope there's been a change for the better between my old and new self, and that tomorrow, next month, next year, they'll be continued to a better new self. I think that's so profound because we are either either slipping forwards or backwards, that we have to be consciously moving in a direction. They call it work, which sometimes I wish it wasn't called spiritual work, but the truth is that it's effort. We need to allow and we need to do the action. So she goes on to say, nothing has done more to urge me forward than the need to carry the al message to the families of alcoholics who are seeking a new way out of their dilemma. The help of others over the same thorny path that one has already trod strengthens both travelers, the helper and the one being helped. Oh, I'm so glad that we got to read that together today. It's just a reminder that we're in this together and that I know for me, my journey is greatly strengthened by being here to help you. And my reminder that I say to myself on a very regular basis is, I don't know anything or have anything different to give you than what is already in you. Just like I'm here to heal myself and through my own healing and my own work, I'm an inspiration to you. And you, through your work and your healing, are an inspiration to those in your life. I can't make you do anything, no matter how beautiful my words are sometimes and how stumbly they are at other times. All I can do is share with you my experience and be a light in the world. Just like for you, you can share your experience and be a light in the world, but our motivation isn't to change others. It's purely to be a healed soul ourselves. It's purely to reflect upon ourselves and to let go of control and hand it over to the higher power of our understanding. I'll always remind you that I'm here for you if you want to do any soul recovery work. One session, a block of sessions, this isn't easy to do alone. And soul recovery is different than Al-Anon and AA. It's a wider scope and it's inspired by, but it is not exclusive to that work. So you're always welcome to book a coaching session. Remember, there's the discount code in the show notes. And I want you to be able to feel supported by me in whatever ways that you are, either on the Facebook group or the social media this is a community. For me, this is a powerful community, and I am so grateful that you are here, that you are supporting it. Until next time, namaste. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Recovery Soul Podcast and being part of this amazing and growing community. If you loved this episode and you want even more, there is a bonus episode with even more content every Friday. This is by subscription. You can access that by being a Patreon member, and there's three tiers of giving of your choice, or an Apple Podcast subscriber. Once you have subscribed, you have access to a whole back catalog of episodes as well. These have interviews, more book studies, meditations, and even more on your soul recovery journey to help support you. So I thank you for becoming a subscriber for this additional content and how it helps support this community. If you would go to the website, recoveryoursoul.net, and I would love for you to subscribe to email updates so that you can keep posted with everything that's going on, different events, what dates are coming up, any reminders. There's only a couple emails each month. I hope you follow Recover Your Soul on social media. You can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, the private Facebook community page. TikTok. And if you want guided meditations, look for Reverend Rachel Harrison on Insight Timer. 
I really encourage you to take advantage of the one-on-one coaching. This is a unique, intuitive connection between the two of us. There are nine steps to soul recovery, and I do use those nine steps to loosely guide us through whatever you're coaching that you need. But really, it's about creating a way for you to feel comfortable around your healing of your past, looking at the situations in your life, what are the patterns, what are the beliefs that are holding you back, breaking free from those patterns, breaking free from those beliefs, letting go of control, letting go of the people around you and how they are making you feel, and taking your power back discovering who you are and who you want to be in the world and how I can support you to do this. It's actually not intended to be a long-term relationship. If you want to try a session, there is a discount code for your first session with me just to see if it feels like a good fit. I really try to keep the prices as reasonable as I can. This isn't about trying to charge what coaches do charge. This is about me being able to make a living to support you on your path. I am here to support you on your soul recovery journey. And also you're sharing this podcast with your friends, putting five stars, leaving reviews, really sharing this with others is growing the community. This is my great mission to bring soul recovery to a larger group that we are growing and supporting each other. And every time I'm in one of our support groups and I see all those faces on Zoom and we share with each other what's really happening in our lives and we connect or in a workshop, it just is so profound that we're doing this work together. We are supporting each other and the fact that I can be part of your life means a lot to me. Thank you for being part of this community. Thank you for supporting Recover Your Soul. And I know that together we can do the work that will recover your soul.